And this is maybe uh, the most important festival, I would have to say, that I've ever been connected to. And it is uh, absolutely my extraordinary honor to be standing uh, next to Dr. Reverend Kevin Cosby, who has been a friend to me for a long time. And um, that friendship has been a great gift to me. And, I, and I, I'd like to think and do feel that it is friendship which can really be the thing uh, that could anchor this very conference, these very days, the spirit of friendship, the spirit of kinship, the spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood, and somehow uh, all of that linking up to the possibility of a sense of family. The idea that we are all one human family has been a profound concept that has uh, really um, sort of challenged me in many ways to think about what that actually is proposing. But I think at its core, it is really saying that a healthy family uh, is a family that is rooted in love. And from love, all sorts of things can spring. But the love has to be a kind of authentic love, uh, a love which could, uh, you know, be uh, often there's a, there's a qualifier that goes along uh, in, in, in spaces like this, on stages like this, that is to add the word kindness uh, to love, so that the idea of loving kindness is sort of a more definitive way of expressing what kind of love we're talking about um, here at, at this festival and going for intentionally. Um, intention is a, is a big thing that we try to get at and use as a core value for how we uh, think of, of what this festival can be. So it is very much our intention that this will be a gathering uh, where difficult conversations can occur in a safe space. And that occurrence is really rooted um, in the idea of openness. Um, and that through a kind of openness and a kind of connection with our own hearts, we are actually grounding ourselves in the God-given or divine-given capacity to live into what a spiritual life actually means. And of course, connected to that would be uh, the proposition of a life of faith. We think a lot about the meaning of these words, and actually they're, they're, they're full of promise and potential and also of work. There's no getting around the fact that uh, the highest aspirations any of us could have for ourselves, let alone our children or our loved ones, actually involve an enormous amount of work. Life is complicated. It is not easy, and there is no time like today to remind us of how true that is. But within that is the promise and potential for something extraordinary. We have seen that time and again, year after year at this festival. We are so honored that you all would join us for this journey. And as I have said many times before, without you, there would be no festival. So please thank yourself for the courage and strength and interest and commitment to join us, those of you here in Louisville, and of course, all of you joining virtually. So with that, my, my, my time is up, and I'm so glad I got to go first, because there's no way I want to follow <laughs> Dr. Reverend Kevin Cosby. But um, know that um, I will be with you for every step of this festival, and I will be listening deeply, and hopefully learning deeply about the promise and potential I was mentioning for a better future than the one that we've known up to now, a brighter day than the, one that we've, the ones that we've seen in some of these dark days of this past 18 months. And I believe wholeheartedly that a bright, bright, brilliant future filled with loving kindness awaits us. So with that, I pass it over to you, good sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much, Owsley. Brother July 15th. And I call him Brother July the 15th because that's my birthday and that's his birthday. <laughs> so we share the same birthday. And my granddaughter, my first grandchild, was born on July the 15th. And now that she's older and she realizes, and I say to her, uh, Zuri, you were born on July, the f I was born on July the 15th. And she said, no, you were not. Choose another day. 
It takes the vessel of faith's courage to create a platform in which we can talk about that which has to be the most polarizing issue of our day. In fact, it may be the most polarizing issue since August of 1619 when the white lion landed 20 plus Africans on the shores of Jamestown, Virginia. And since that time, we have not been able to get this issue of race right. There's a little proverb that we often flippantly throw around as an excuse for ignorance and alibi for not finding out the facts. And here is the flippant little proverb. What you don't know won't hurt you. I hope divinity has forgiven the foolish person who made that statement. Because ignorance is not a virtue. Ignorance is a human tragedy. It killed Christ. For the first words he uttered from the cross were these words, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Ignorance, what we have not learned. There's so many things we've not learned. So many babies died because physicians just didn't wash their hands because they didn't understand. Our mothers died, babies died because they didn't understand the spread of germs. What we have not learned, ignorance, what we have mislearned, Ignorance plus prejudice, what we've mislearned, and more importantly, what we refuse to learn. Ignorance plus prejudice plus obstinance. We're not only ignorant, but we're also ignorant of the nature of our ignorance. Because our ignorance is not in our head. That's, that's woeful ignorance, but the ignorance is in our heart, willful, not wanting to know. But because we have gathered, we're going to do our best to overcome ignorance and learn that only when we turn to each other and not on each other, only when we learn that we don't have to see eye to eye to walk hand in hand, can we realize that beloved community that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. dreamed about. It is an honor to be here today. Peace and blessings.
I'm Renee Shaw, Director of Public Affairs and Moderator at Kentucky Educational Television. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, part of Festival of Faiths, and it's an honor to be on the stage with these two gentlemen and someone that we're teleporting in in just a moment. So I'm going to make the introductions, and then we will follow the program. First, I'm going to formally introduce, you just heard, Mr. July 15th. Uh, <laughs> The Reverend Dr. Kevin Cosby, for more than 40 years, Reverend Cosby has served as senior pastor of St. Stephen Baptist Church, Kentucky's largest African-American church. He is the 13th president of Simmons College of Kentucky, where he led the college to reclaim its original campus and expand. Cosby uncovered the rich history of Simmons, which was established by former slaves. And in 2014, Simmons was recognized as a historically black college and university. Cosby convened the Angela Project, named after the first enslaved person to step off the slave ship in Jamestown. He was inducted into the gallery of great black Kentuckians at the state capitol, and at the request of Muhammad Ali, we all remember, he served as a eulogist at his funeral. Dr. Cosby's book, Getting to the Promised Land, is available for purchase at the virtual bookstore. Please give a round of applause to the Reverend Dr. Kevin W. Cosby. Joining us virtually, we're going to teleport her in. The very Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean Douglas, is the Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary, where in 2019 she was named the Bill and Judith Moyers Chair in Theology. She also serves as Canon Theologian at Washington National Cathedral and Theologian in Residence at Trinity Church Wall Street. Her academic work is focused on womanist theology, sexuality, and the black church and social justice. Previously, she taught at Goucher College, Howard University, and Edward Waters College. She's the author of books including Sexuality in the Black Church, A Womanist Perspective, and Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God. Her latest book, Resurrection of Hope, A Future Where Black Lives Matter, is available for purchase at the virtual bookstore. Let's give her a virtual round of applause. Last but not least, Imam Zaid Shakur, born in Berkeley, California, served in the U.S. Air Force from 1976 until 1981, during which time he accepted Islam. He obtained a B.A. in International Relations at American University and earned his M.A. in Political Science from Rutgers University. While at Rutgers, he led a campaign that culminated in the university divesting from South Africa. Zaid co-founded Zaiduna College, the first accredited Islamic liberal arts college. He is a signatory of a declaration in support of the Paris Climate Agreement, and he authored the Muslim response to Pope Francis's en encyclical on climate change. Zaid had the honor of leading the funeral prayer, as we will well remember, of Muhammad Ali. CNN has listed him as among the 25 most influential American Muslims. Please give Imam Zaid Shakur a round of applause. So at this time, we will turn to Reverend Dr. Kevin Cosby and allow him to regale us with his prose and wisdom. Thank you. I remember um, hearing um, several elected officials respond to the question, is America a racist nation? And each of them said, no, we are post-racial. America is not a racial, racist nation. And these were the assessments of both conservatives and liberals or moderates, if you may. America is not a racist nation. But if I were asking the question, is America a racist nation, I would ask this question, what do you mean by racism? Because we're not very clear on what racism is. And because we all have our own definitions of what racism is, one of the reasons we cannot fix it is because we cannot nail down what racism is. Many think that we have moved beyond racism because um, the word or the phrase that is used quite often in corporate America today is um, 
uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But I'd like to ask you a question when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that is diversity, equity, and inclusion into what? James Baldwin in his book, The Fire Next Time, says, I have a fear that we are integrating black people into a burning house. Diversity, equity, and inclusion into what? And then secondly, who gets to determine what diversity and equity and inclusion looks like? Because someone is still in power. Thirdly, how will diversity, equity, and inclusion affect the masses of blacks in urban ghettos? like West Louisville, who have obsolete job skills because racial injustice and the malfeasance of public education. So when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion into the, of the black professional class, which is often a one-way black to white integration into white non-egalitarian space. And more importantly, when we talk about diversity, equity, and conclusion, what happens when the pendulum of racial repair swings back to the antithesis of racial disrepair, which has been the pattern throughout American history, uh, according to the critical race theorists like Derrick Bell, who says that racism in these united hates of America is permanent. And that we will have peaks of progress that will eventually return back to white domination, which is the historical pattern here in the United States. Racism, according to Dirk Bell, is an integral, permanent, and indestructible component of this society. Because this is true, not only will we not overcome in the sense that we all of us believe so fervently in the 1960s, black people will never achieve full equality with whites. At best, we can hope for what I have called temporary peaks of progress, short-lived periods of improved conditions that last a few years until white dominance once again reasserts itself. Quite often when we talk about um, racial progress, this is what we mean. Symbols. We've changed the street to Martin Luther King Boulevard. Holidays, I'm giving you Juneteenth. <laughs> Images, look at the University of Louisville, um, University of Kentucky, the University of Alabama's football team. Get a picture of it. Look at what it was in, the, in 1970. Now look at what it is now. See? Look at the image, the optics. We've changed. Tokenism. We have a few blacks or browns or Latinos or Latinx uh, in our company, but they're in positions without power and they have status without strength. I just gave you that because I know that y'all remember it. <laughs> Let me define racism. Racism is when whites hold a disproportionate amount of wealth, power, and resources over blacks and use those advantages to advance white interests while at the same time marginalizing and exploiting and subordinating black Americans as the bottom caste in society. This country is 60% white, but whites possess over 90% of the wealth. Blacks constitute 13% of the country's population. We possess less than 3% of the wealth. In other words, since 1865, when quote unquote slavery uh, ended December of 1865, the passing of the 13th Amendment, 
blacks' wealth positionality has not changed. We don't have wealth. And because we don't have wealth, blacks are hated because we're black, but we're mistreated because we're poor. Benjamin May said, the, the mentor of Martha King and president of Morehouse College said, discrimination in the future will not be administered by poor whites and people who believe in segregation, but by the liberals who believe in a desegregated society. If this battle can be won, Morehouse will have an equal chance to develop like any other good college in America. The Negroes' battle for justice and equality in the future will not be against the subtleties of our liberal friends who wine and dine us in the swankiest hotels, work with us, and still discriminate against us when it comes to money and power. This battle must be won for, for a long time because for a long time, the wealth of this nation will be in the hands of white Americans and not Negroes. The abolition of economic, political, and philanthropic discrimination is the first order of the day not for the good of the Negroes alone, but for the nation as a whole. This speech I'm giving is an excerpt from a speech that Martha King Jr. gave here in Louisville, Kentucky in August of 1966. If you know about King's life, you know the beginning in 1965, he said, my dream has turned into a nightmare. Because Dr. King understood that what race is, is it is about the wealth gap that exists. And that, that he realized that in 66, and even today, the problem is residential segregation. That because of policies of redlining, that has segregated every city in America. And he realized that because whites, and this is true of liberals and conservatives today, do not believe in affordable housing in suburban neighborhoods or to give black subsidies so that they can purchase houses commensurate with the property, the value of the properties in, in more affluent, high opportunity neighborhoods. He said, because the country is not committed to that. He said, we've got to do something in urban areas, and this is what Dr. King said, August the 2nd, 1967. He says, I don't believe in black separatism. I'm against it. But I do say this, it seems that our white brothers and sisters don't want to live next door to us. So they're, pining, uh, they're pinning us in central cities. We're hemmed in. We can't get out. They won't pass fair housing bill here, Louisville, Kentucky, and that's true in every city in this country. Now, since they're just going to keep us here, we're going to have to do, we have to do is, what we have to do is control the central city. We've got to be the mayors of the big cities, and the minute we get elected mayors, we've got to be, begin taxing everybody who works in the city, who lives in the suburbs. I know this sounds mean, but I just want to be realistic. In other words, since there's going to be urban areas like West Louisville, We've got to create social infrastructure for the people in, this commu in these communities. Institutions that is going to service the people in these communities. It's going to bring services, your infrastructure. If your bridges break down, you cannot bring supplies and resources. Those are the infrastructure, the bridges, the roads, the railways. And it is community social infrastructures and institutions that, provide, that bring in services to communities. These infrastructures have broken down in urban communities because we did one-way integration. So we did one-way integration, so we start off with segregation, then we go from desegregation, then we go to integration that has been the disintegration of institutions in the community that service our people. And Dr. King said, I don't want to be integrated out of existence, which is to say, well, let me put it this way. This is what we need. Instead of diversity, equity, and inclusion, we need diversity, equity, inclusion, capitalization, and empowerment. And capitalization and empowerment is what needs to take place in black neighborhoods. We need cash. 
The black community, all my life has been a place to leave. We need to make it a place to live. And the reason it's a place to leave and not a place to live is because it has never been a place to love. And the way you love the black community is love is a four letter word, C-A-S-H. I close. This is white space when I was a kid. Integration meant get integrated into the Lawrence Walk Show. Can't do it. Or get integrated into Hee Haw. I can't do it. Or get integrated into the American Bandstand of the Ed Sullivan Show. I can't do it. So this is what we need. We need Hee Haw. We need the American Bandstand. We need Lawrence Welk. <laughs> but in a plural society, we also need this. Soul Train. <laughs> we need Soul Train. And until we can build some Soul Trains right next to Lawrence Welk, we will never fix the issue of race because race is about the gap that exists, the wealth and opportunity gap that exists between communities that we must close so that one community uh, is a high opportunity community while other communities like the black community is a no to low opportunity community. Thank you. Dr. Cosby, you gave us quite a bit to think about and some acronyms that we'll remember, perhaps not on Sunday morning. Let's not get the Holy Spirit too much and shout one of those out, right? But let's put that in the scope of, of, of where we are in Louisville, right? In yeah. Jefferson County. Yeah. How do you put your presentation in context of the divides here in Louisville? Well, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, um, there's a lot of ignorance, mm -hmm. and it's not, it's not woeful ignorance of the, of the mind. It's willful ignorance of the heart. Mm -hmm. We just don't want to know the truth of the mythology of, American, of America. It's a, it's, a, it's a myth. There's so much pushback, for example, against the 1619 Project mm -hmm. and uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Yes. And all Nicole Hannah-Jones is simply saying is this, is that the, the, the Mayflower came in, in uh, 1620, but one year before the Mayflower came, Mayflower lands on Plymouth Rock, one year before the Mayflower comes, the White Lion comes in 1619, so we came before the Mayflower. But all my life, Mm -hmm. I have been centered in the Mayflower on a boat I was never on. <laughs> I was on the White Lion. Mm -hmm. So there is no room in, American, in, in, in our society that we're pushing back against saying that this is our history, this is our experience. And it's all about what you experience. I mean, you know, if you ask um, who's the villain on the, on the, um, in the story of the Three Pigs, well, you're going to say the wolf, and that's because you're pig-centric. <laughs> but I talked to the wolf. I went to the Hall of Justice and talked to the wolf who's in jail. And I said, I have to speak at the Festival of Faith, so would you please tell me what really happened so I can share with them what happened? And he said, this is what happened. He said, I was the first wolf in an all-pig neighborhood. <laughs> And I was analogy. sick, and the stores were closed. Yeah. I went to my neighbor's house to see if I could get some NyQuil. I sneezed. <laughs> the house fell down on the pig and killed the pig, and I thought, there's no need wasting all this chitlins, pig feet, and <laughs> ham hock. So I ate them. I guess I'm saying is that a point of view is a view from someone's point. 
Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And until we have enough courage, James Baldwin again says, everything you face you cannot fix, mm -hmm. but you will never be able to fix what you cannot, what you will not mm -hmm. face. That's right, that's right. And uh, so in my city of Louisville, because of redlining, because of disinvestment, because of the stigma of being black, because of powerlessness, there is a sense of hopelessness and, and nihilism that has gripped my city, my part of town where I live and work, like I have never seen before. People are walking around with no hope. Mm -hmm. And until we can say that these underserved, underinvested communities, we've got to find a way to invest in them as brothers and sisters, then we will never fix race. We will always have nothing but symbols, holidays, images, and tokens. Right. But there has been action on the state level, the West End Empowerment Project, right? That they, there are lawmakers who say, well, we see what's happening and we have ideas on how to fix it, but do they have vision but no sight? They have vision with no provision. <laughs> uh, um, they, the, the state cannot fix this. This, they can contribute. Philanthropy can't fix this. Mm -hmm. Philanthropy should play its role. Mm -hmm. There should not be philanthropic discrimination as Benjamin May said. Simmons did not get its first grant from a philanthropy, a, from a foundation until 2014. We started in 1879. Mm -hmm. What would happen if the white institutions didn't get a grant until for 120 years? Mm -hmm. The only entity that can fix this is the same entity that caused the problem in the first place, the federal government. Mm -hmm. And the federal government can only has, has the resources to fix this through reparations. If you take the money that black people have 246 years of slavery plus another 100 plus years of semi-slavery that built this country. This country owes black Americans in reparations over $10 trillion, which means we can take it in multi-generations, because I'm not gonna see it in my generation, but it's gonna take multi-generations to close this gap. And the only question, as Dr. Martin King used, King used to say, is do we have the will to do it? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we have the heart? Do we have the heart to do it? A lot of things to ponder, and we'll have some time to kind of dive a little deeper, but now we're going to hear from Dean Douglas. It was a hot Wednesday afternoon in August. My brother, two sisters, and I were playing in our bedrooms while my parents were sitting on the living room couch watching something on TV. Out of nowhere, with a sense of urgency, my mother called the four of us to come quickly to see what they were watching. We all ran in, not quite knowing what to expect. When we got there, my parents told us to sit down and watch because history was being made. I did not know what they meant by that, but I followed their instructions. I sat and I watched the history that was being made on the television screen. I remember watching and wondering why so many people, especially black people, were all standing in the hot sun listening to a man give a speech. That history-making day was August 28, 1963, when Martin Luther King Jr. seized the American imagination with his anti-racist dream for this nation and its people. What I did not realize then 
Was that for my parents, the history being made in that moment in time was also about their hope that the dream they had for their four children was coming closer to reality on that very day. They too hoped for their children to live in an anti-racist world where they, as King said, would be judged for the color of their skin, not for the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. They too hoped, as King dreamed, for a time when little black children and little white children would be able to join hands as siblings. What I did not realize at that time was the sense of urgency that my parents no doubt felt as they listened to King. For they knew what I would only come to know as an adult. And that is that eight years earlier, on that very day, another mother's hopes and dreams for her child would come to a tragic end. In the two o'clock a.m. hour of August 28, 1955, Mamie Till's 14-year-old son, Emmett Lewis Till, was dragged from a relative's home where he was staying in Mississippi and lynched because he was accused of flirting with a 22-year-old white woman. And here we are, decades after King's speech and Emmett Till's lynching, yet these two events on this one August day still capture the searing truth of this nation. Ours is a nation that seems to be content with letting black people die. And so the question becomes for me on this day, how are we to maintain faith, let alone hope, in a nation where the matter of black lives has still not been settled? James Baldwin once said, that there comes a time in the life of every black person in America when they must face the shock of discovering, and I quote him, that the flag to which you have pledged allegiance has not pledged allegiance to you. As the mother of a six foot tall, lock wearing, proud 28 year old black man, fearing for his life in this nation as much as I did on the day when he was born, and realizing the gravity of this country's sin of white supremacist anti-blackness that is a mortal threat to all black life, I have found myself facing the shock, as James Baldwin says, the shock that perhaps the God of Jesus Christ, in whom black people have pledged our faith, has not pledged allegiance to us. That shock was made even more real by the questions my son asked me as black death was becoming more and more routine in this nation, whether at the hands of police or from the COVID-19 virus. My son challenged my faith in the God of Jesus Christ. He challenged my theological affirmation of a black Christ. How do we really know that God cares when black people are still getting killed? How long do we have to wait for God's justice, he asked. I get it that Christ is black, but that doesn't seem to be helping us right now, he proclaimed. These questions set me on a journey to try to understand the meaning of my faith, if not its efficacy amidst the cries for black lives to matter. For indeed, the questions my son was asking me became my own questions. My journey culminated in the book, Resurrection Hope, A Future Where Black Lives Matter. Theologian Paul Tillich reminds us that, as he says, the element of uncertainty in faith cannot be removed. Essentially, Tillich is reminding us that doubt is intrinsic to faith. Black faith, it seems to me, in fact, reflects a constant struggle to make sure that our doubts do not overwhelm our faith. 
At least this has been the case for me as I have tried to journey through the doubts intrinsic to my faith in light of the black life loss to anti-black violence. The lives that were Armand, that were Brianna, that were George, and so many more. Indeed, I began to wonder whether God's promise in a just future is to be believed at all. Not only was it hard for me to live in the promise yet to be fulfilled, but with each almost daily reminder that black life does not really matter in this nation, I no longer trusted the promise itself. And so, in my faith journey, I have essentially walked through the valley of death when it comes to black life, not knowing as I walked if on the other side I would affirm my faith or give in to my doubts. And so it is that my journey through the crucifying realities of black death to an attempt to find the resurrection hope of black life was a journey to discover that resurrecting hope of black faith that allowed those black people who were born into slavery, died in slavery and never drew a free breath and never dreamt that they would ever breathe a free breath to fight for freedom anyhow and thus to maintain hope that the freedom that was the justice of God would one day become a reality for all black lives. How do you continue to hope, my son finally asked. Decades after King's dream and Emmett Till's death, this is a question that continues to plague a black people as we navigate life in a nation for which the matter of black life has not been settled. This is the question that I look forward to discussing in this conference today. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've now figured out that that was a recorded message from Dean Douglas, but she is with us. We've teleported her in this makeshift uh, living room. And Dean Douglas, I, I, I want to pick up on the point and maybe ask you, where are you now? Has your theological assumptions and beliefs been reaffirmed? And when we think about how white evangelicals have uh, claimed kind of a tribalistic view of racism, of supremacy, of division. How, how do you reconcile almost the co-opting and hijacking of Jesus Christ by white evangelicals for their cause while blacks still suffer? Yes, first of all, thank you uh, again for having me here. And it's great to have this kind of technology that I can be teleported in uh, into this conversation, and, and thank you, uh, Dr. Cosby, for your remarks. Let me say first, as you ask, where am, am I now? I, I, I think that which sort of continues to give me hope is indeed the fact that uh, people continue to fight uh, for justice, for freedom, for a more just future, as long as there are people who are resisting the violent realities that dehumanize other human beings, then that to me is always a sign of hope uh, and uh, uh, a sign that keeps me from sort of this enduring despair. And so I in fact do always remind myself that there were those who were enslaved uh, that never breathed a free breath, but continue to fight for freedom. And it is because of their fight for freedom that we are here in this discussion uh, in the first place as people blessed with Ebony Grace. Uh, the other thing is you talk about uh, the sort of white evangelical, quote unquote, co-opting, uh, if you will, of uh, the Christian message in a particular way. Uh, and being influenced, if you will, by and buying into uh, the mega, the Make America Great Again vision, we have to be reminded of uh, something else. And while we often point to the fact 
that over 80% of white evangelicals supported the Make America Great Again vision. What we often overlook is the fact that 60% of white Catholics, as well as 60% of mainline uh, white Protestants, also supported that MAGA vision. And so in not acknowledging that, we are missing a wider point. And it seems to me that that point has to do, or what we're missing is the fact that there's something about whiteness and that vision that has allowed people to support a vision that presumably runs counter to their very faith claims. Uh, to, uh, and of course, I speak from uh, my particular Christian perspective, but it's, it's not an exclusive uh, perspective in, in, in the least, but recognizing the reality and the power of this white construct, this construct uh, that privileges whiteness, white supremacy, that privileges whiteness and the way in which it has shaped uh, a people's gaze as well as uh, a people's sense of really what it means to be a, a citizen of this country and, and indeed has allowed them to support a vision that presumably uh, is contrary to their, the values of their very faith tradition. So that's the, uh, the first thing that I want to point out, that it's just not a white evangelical narrative. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cosby, I'll have, allow you to comment on that real quickly before we go to your mom. Uh, in response. In response to Dean Douglas. Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for your profound homily and for your brilliant writings that has greatly influenced uh, uh, me. Um, you know, it, it, it seems that at, at times other entities in society has done a better job bringing us together than faith. Hmm. Uh, before the, um, uh, the Civil War broke out in 1861, all of the major Protestant denominations split over the issue of slavery, like the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians. So um, there's so much despair now um, because of the absence of hope that it makes you wonder, and you alluded to this in your presentation, it makes you wonder about resurrecting William Jones's book that he wrote in the 1970s is God a white racist? Mm. And that, I think your son was alluding to mm -hmm. the whole issue of theodicy that Jones brings up, that if we're talking about this is the festival of faiths, that, that many blacks uh, are moving towards more humanism because it seems that, to the, that there is very little historical evidence to suggest that God loves black people. I remember mm -hmm. Dr. Douglas, I remember Ellie Wiesel when he was here in Louisville speaking at Louisville's Presbyterian Seminary. And he said that before the Holocaust, Jews believed in God and not the devil. Mm -hmm. After the Holocaust, we started believing more in the devil than in God because it seemed that there was more evidence for Satan than there was for God. How would you respond yeah. to that? Yeah. May, I, may I speak of it for a minute? That I think when, when we talk about faith communities and our faith leaders and you know, without getting deeply into sort of the theological issues, if indeed we are to provide a sense of hope, it's not so much what we say, but it's what we do. And I think the role of faith leaders uh, and religious leaders in this nation is to begin to expand the moral imaginary 
the moral imaginary of what is possible and the moral imaginary of what justice looks like. We are to be accountable as religious leaders of whatever tradition that we uh, belong to. We are to be accountable to not the way things are, but the way things we know are supposed to be. We are to be accountable to a more just future. And our measure of justice should not be limited by the policies and politics, et cetera, of an unjust nation, but indeed uh -huh. by a vision for a more just future, which we have to, it is our role to expand that moral imaginary. And so, and I'll say this and then <laughs> shut up. So when we talk about things, for instance, as you brought up Dr. Simmons of rep reparations, I think that that's a, an important conversation uh, uh, and that we do have to begin to seriously talk about reparations. But, and here's the thing, for faith leaders we, and religious leaders, we have to push the conversation about reparations beyond simply trying to repair the breach, if you will, that is the wealth gap, the choice gap uh, between, that has been created between the, uh, because of the past, between the past and the present. We are called to repair the breach between this unjust future and this unjust present and the just future to which we are all called. And so it seems to me that that requires more than simply uh, paying, giving uh, black people reparations, monetary reparations, because we can do that and we can make apologies and we ought to do that, try, but we, what we aren't doing are repairing this changing, actually, the systems and structures that got us here in the first place. Our task is to change this reality, change these systems and structures, so that indeed we repair the gap, the breach, between this unjust present reality that is defined by white supremacist anti-blackness and, 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 and these capitalistic structures that are racialized and to get to a more just future so that generations uh, ahead of us, future generations, will not indeed be st still be talking about wealth gaps, choice gaps, uh, grief gaps as a, 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 a reporter I just wrote about in the Washington Post this week, these kind of gaps that are reflective of systemic, structural, ideological kind of realities that indeed create the kind of inequity and equality that have gotten us to this point. And this is the role, I think, of faith leaders to be engaged in the public square and to begin to talk about closing the gap between what is and what we know ought to be. Mm -hmm. Well said. So Imam Zaid Shakur, I wanna ask you to make your presentation, but I would like for you to expand on this reasoning, this rationale that was given us by Dean Douglas about expanding our moral imagination between the just and the unjust and getting to the justice. Right now? Well, however, however order you want to do it, sir. Yeah, I, I'm going to touch on that in my brief comments. Sure. And then we can follow up after that. Sure. Okay. So diversity. Uh, Reverend Dr. Cosby did the TED Talk. And Dean Dr. Douglas did the transport telepathy, beam me down, Scotty. <laughs> so I'm going to use the podium. Oh, yes. So, uh, start. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim which means, in the name of God, most compassionate, most merciful. Uh, you know, this is a wonderful space, and I'm, I'm blessed and honored to be here, to be sharing this space, especially with the uh, likes of Dr. Cosby, and a very accomplished uh, moderator. Uh, 
Ms. Rene and Dean Dr. Douglas. And I, I think this is a very important space uh, because uh, it, it allows us the opportunity to talk about very, very difficult things. Things that might be uh, perhaps impossible to talk about in other spaces. But since this is the festival of faith, I'll start by saying, with God, all things are possible. So I, I like to start with, uh, by referencing something that uh, Bishop Reverend Dr. William Barber mentioned the other day in uh, response to the comment of one of the uh, defense attorneys for the uh, murderers of Ahmed Arbery, lynchers of Ahmed uh, Ahmad Arbery, who's found the presence of black ministers in the courtroom intimidating to the jurors. And Dr. Barber responded very wisely, and, and much of what he said you can read in an op-ed today in the uh, Washington Post. He mentioned that I, or, or as a black minister, I must be careful not to accept the framing of, I'm paraphrasing him, of that defense attorney in the sense that as a black pastor, I am intimidating. He said, no, I'm, I'm not a black pastor. I'm a pastor who happens to be black. Right, right. And why? Because my ministry is to all of the people of this country. And he said that was Jesus' ministry. And he didn't dismiss, and you can read about it or you can play it back, he didn't dismiss the, the, the violence of white supremacy. He didn't dismiss the role that white supremacy played in making blackness so intimidating. He talked about all that. But he emphasized that his message is for everyone in this country, including white folks. And I'd like to, to just mention briefly, and this goes to expanding the imaginary. If the white Catholics, Presbyterian, Baptists, Methodists, Lutherans, Evangelicals are not going to bring what true humanity is, what true religion is, what true faith is to their congregations and their flocks, then it is the responsibility of black ministers and black imams to bring it to them. And I say that because without all of us, we're not going to crack the nut of racism in this country. And that's why one of the greatest projects of white supremacy has been to undermine the creation of transracial solidarity in addressing it. From Bacon's rebellion, Come on, man. to the populist movement, mm. to the socialist movement in the 20s and 30s, that was a number one priority, right. was to destroy that solidarity. Yes, sir. And so we have to understand that, because if we don't get it right this time, there might be not be a next time because the fate of our democracy stands in the balance. When you see the creeping authoritarianism, what Chris Hedges refers to as uh, a type of fascism, I won't mention the full name. Uh, when we see that happening in this country, there might not be a next time for us to get it right without, uh, without uh, unfortunately, without a lot of violence and bloodshed. It do, but it doesn't have to be that way. But for it not to be that way, we're going to have to be courageous, and we're going to have to, uh, again, expanding the imaginary, we're going to have to start asking some different types of questions. I'm going to ask one right now. How many of you have ever seen a white person gunned down by police on television? We have to ask, why is that a reality? Because twice as many white folks are killed by cops every year in this country than black folks. 
Twice as many. Now I'm, trying, I'm not trying to dismiss the reality that if you're black, you're three or four times more likely to be killed by a policeman. We're not dismissing that reality, but the, what, twice as many white folks are being killed by police. Why don't we see it on television? The body cameras don't work all of a sudden. You know, uh, the, the dispatcher, something happens and they suddenly can't say that there's a, a white person who was shot by a cop down on so-and-so or such and such. I would argue that it's because if white folks saw what black folks were experiencing happening to their own people, it would be a whole lot easier to create that kind of transracial solidarity that's going to begin to seriously threaten and challenge the racist order. And those are the kinds of questions I would argue we need to start asking. In conclusion, <laughs> five minutes. I could say we're getting warmed up, but in conclusion, I want to quote an expert on religion, Karl Marx. Now, Marx is oftentimes misquoted. All of you have heard religion is the opium, opium of the people. You've all heard that. And, and the connotation is religion makes people not want to struggle, puts them to sleep. You know, they start nodding off because religion oh, you know, people. But Marx has been misrepresented tremendously. The full quote is the following. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature. It is the heart of a heartless world. It is the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. What is Marx saying? Marx is saying, and something that was mentioned, why were those slaves able to continue to struggle, continue to hope, continue to fight, continue to resist, continue to believe in God? Because religion gave them a heart. And if you have a heart, you're, you're, and your heart is free to imagine, and your heart is free to think. It doesn't matter if change are on your body. And because they had hearts and they had souls, they could continue to struggle. And this is very important for us to understand because when we talk about the nihilism that we see, especially amongst many of our young folks, we can't divorce that from the fact that this is the age of organized atheism. And it's infecting our young people, more so than us who preceded the advent or the, 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 the strengthening, the culmination of this age. When I was coming of age, we didn't have to deal with the likes of Christopher Hitchens and Sam Dawkins or Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and the rest of the crew. We don't have to deal with that nonsense. That's what it is, too. But our young people have to deal with it. And because of that, they don't have religion to buttress their hearts. They don't have religion to edify their souls. They don't have religion to provide a foundation that transcends this world and the physicality of this world to give them a vision wide enough to continue to struggle despite the difficulty and the daunting nature of the challenges before them. It's no accident. And this is why it's absolutely critically important that we as religious folks, as folks of faith, not only hold on to our faith, but have the confidence to offer it to our young people. Those who are black folks of faith have the confidence to offer it to white folks. Frederick Douglass wasn't just speaking to us. He was speaking to the conscience of this nation. And there were people to, who listened to him. And if we say there weren't people who listened to him, we could analyze the motivations as much as we want. We can deconstruct their, their objectives as much as we want. But there are hundreds of thousands of dead white folks who defended Lincoln's freeing of our people. That's a reality. Like I said, we could, we could deconstruct it. We can analyze it. But we shouldn't dishonor the memory of those who have died in solidarity with our struggle. Two of them, we, 
our, our one of the end was a Mr. Rittenhouse. He didn't kill two black folks who were standing in solidarity with that young man, black man, Blake, Mr. Blake, who was shot in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He killed two white folks who were standing in solidarity with a black man, Mr. Blake. All right, we, we, we have to have the ability to not be cornered by approaches that are easily exploited in this day of social media. And it's not a coincidence that alternative facts have risen up during the age of social media because a lie can spread so fast with so much power that it's very difficult to undo it. That's the nature of our times. So may we be blessed with wisdom and courage. May we be blessed to, to ask difficult questions, to have difficult discussions and conversations not to a shy, shy away from them. And may we be blessed to have a faith so strong that it's, it's infectious. It's infectious. It's like the coronavirus. <laughs> but no mask can stop it. May that be the kind of faith that we have. We have a, I'll conclude a, a statement of one of our Muslim theologians, the great Fakhreddin, uh, Arazi, uh, who's known in the West, uh, Averroes, uh, that's actually Ibn Rushd, somebody else. But Fakhreddin Arazi, he was a great theolo theological mind, one of the greatest in human history. And uh, one day uh, he was giving a, an explanation for the existence of God and uh, someone, there was an old lady passing by. And uh, someone said, that's the great Fakhreddin al-Razi. He has a hundred uh, explanations for the existence of, a hundred arguments for the existence of God. And the old lady said, and Fakhreddin al-Razi overheard her. The old lady said, if he didn't have a hundred doubts, he wouldn't need a hundred arguments. <laughs> And Razi said, if only I had the faith of old ladies. We need the faith of our grandmamas, brothers and sisters. Salaam Superb, superb. Thank you so much for that superb presentation. I think the podium served you well. <laughs> I want to, to have Dean Douglas and, and Dr. Cosby weigh in on that last point that you were making about this corruption of transracial solidarity and where the faith community can bridge that gap. And Dr. Cosby, I'll ask you. I, I say just amen, hallelujah. <laughs> amen, hallelujah. And I'm glad you, you mentioned the, the, the Bacon's Rebellion of 1676. Uh, and, you know, most people, we did arrive in 1619 but white indentured servants and black people worked together, they intermarried. It was only when the Virginia Commonwealth started engineering policies and created the artificial construct of blackness and whiteness mm -hmm. that we got there, and you're totally right. We wouldn't, be, even Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad said, if John Brown can be in the, in the nation of Islam, because if you didn't have the Thaddeus Stevens and the Charles Sumners and the Viola Luzos and in our own community, um, so many white champions. And so um, my question is, is that how can this solidarity, the, the barbers and them filter down? I mean, there's so much hopelessness and despair, I think, in poor urban neighborhoods, like in Baltimore, West Louisville. How can we together filter down hope to the least of these who are in our community. What's your answer? Well, I think that we, I don't think as a person of faith, I think that our number one job is not to give answers. Mm. So where I think do they that sometimes come from? we give too many simplistic answers to complex problems. Yeah, so where should they come from? I think our first job is to empathize uh -huh. and to feel the pain right. and take seriously 
the existential reality of hurting people. Because I'm a person of privilege. Everyone who is, on, you know, we're per people of privilege. Mm -hmm. but, but where would I be if I was homeless? Mm -hmm. If I'm homeless living out in a tent, as I see all in Louisville, and you mentioned in, 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 in California, mm -hmm. what does it mean to them? Mm -hmm. How do we engender hope and, and especially one thing that our grandmothers had that we don't have today is the reason they were able to develop hope is because they had institutions. Mm -hmm. We don't have those same strong family institutions, right. churches. Mm -hmm. The church that Muhammad Ali grew up in, Centennial Olivet Baptist Church on the corner of 16th and Oak, where his father painted the mural on the, on the wall of Muhammad, 16th and Oak. It's boarded up. Mm -hmm. right. Dean Douglas, I'll ask you, where's the hope yeah. and where is the faith community in restoring that? Yeah, th th thank you. And thank you, uh, uh, Iman, for uh, your words uh, and very powerful words. Look, I think we began to nurture hope by changing the very conditions that foster despair. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that means we really have to begin to not simply advocate for different conditions, but we have to do the hard work of demanding that, right? So that we are talking about people who are trapped in conditions that foster life, foster death, excuse me, not life. These are the conditions, if you will, of racialized poverty and that it is brown and black people disproportionately are trapped in conditions of poverty, and conditions of poverty are conditions that uh, are, uh, reflect uh, not only inadequate housing opportunities and adequate health care and adequate educational opportunities and adequate recreational opportunities, inadequate opportunities that nurture and foster life. Those conditions are violent. And violence creates violence. And so when we talk about black-on-black uh, -black crime, et cetera, well, what the miracle is that more black people have not uh, right. killed each other and killed themselves in conditions that are meant to foster their death, not their life. Mm -hmm. We begin to foster hope when we say your life is valuable, your life is sacred, that you are a sacred human being, and therefore we refuse to allow you to live in these conditions. So our task as faith leaders is not simply to, to preach about hope, yes, right, we right. do, not simply to uh, help people to understand that they in fact are not uh, indeed meant to live in such conditions, but our task is also to try to change those conditions. And, and, and when we do begin to say to people, you don't deserve to live here, and so we're gonna make sure that you don't have to live in these kind of conditions, then we begin to nurture that seed of hope. Because right now, they're living in conditions that of course foster despair. Right. Yes. Yeah, I'd like um, to address that. Absolutely. Uh, I, I agree that. You know, these, these are difficult uh, issues and they're not amenable to simplistic and simple solutions. But I think both Dr. Cosby and Dr. Douglas em emphasize a beginning and then action. So first of all, I think we have to acknowledge we have a lot to work with. There's a lot of nihilism, there's a lot of breakdown in, in our community amongst the younger people, but there's a lot of hope also when we say 25% of black, young black men between 18 or 30 are on parole in prison under the care of the penal, that means 75% aren't. That's right. 
And I think we have to begin a process to a certain extent of triage that those that we can touch, those relatives in our family, those young folks that we have relations with, we have to start mentoring them. We have to start educating them. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in public housing. My mother's single mother. Single mothers out there, if you're struggling with your one or two children, she has seven to raise by herself. And, you know, I, I have friends that didn't make it out of their 20s, many. OD, AIDS, took out two, mm. drugs, mm. irresponsible living, mm -hmm. youth violence. Mm. Uh, but I, I can definitely say that education made a huge difference in my life. And, I, you know, I'm trying to help educate as many of those young brothers as I can either personally, uh, there's an incredible program. I, I think she might, might not do, be doing any more. She's retiring, but uh, Dr. Fatima Jackson, a, a world-renowned geneticist, also at, for a time she was uh, the head of the African, uh, African Studies Department at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. She started a program, she's from uh, DC, Maryland area, where they took very talented and some not so talented high school kids. They created a, an informal school, a storefront school, and they had African-American professors from the University of Maryland, Howard University, American University, come and teach those high school kids. And, and so uh, I think we can begin to find creative solutions where we're not going to save everyone right away, but we can begin to save enough of our young folks and by being creative and by being dedicated to them that we can begin to create a critical mass where those we are able to save who are a lot closer to their peers can begin to reach out and as they say, each one teach one and over time we can make a tremendous difference in our communities. But it starts with, with simple things and it starts from humble beginnings. You know, the mighty Ohio River somewhere it flows crazy. In the mountains of West Virginia or wherever, the, it started with one drop of water. They're joined with another and another and another and little rivulets, rivulets and streaks and creeks rather and streams and tributaries and they came together and when we look out at this Ohio River, we said, that's a lot of water. But it didn't start like that. So we just have to get busy and be creative and think outside of the box. Like we're, we, we can't see ourselves trapped in a situation where our only alternatives are those that the federal, state, municipal government provide for us because they oftentimes have their own priorities that don't include us. So we have to begin to be creative and, and really understand what helped us to succeed and how can we replicate that in a lot of our young brothers and sisters coming up today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can I, take a, thank a you, can, can I just say one absolutely. thing to that? Yes, absolutely. If I may, it, it, it's hard, to, and because and, I can't uh, see you so well, uh, reality, so I don't mean to interrupt at all, and please stop me if I do. I'm but uh, one, I want to say amen to that, and yeah, that we've got to run, do simultaneous things, right? Yeah. We've got to... Uh, continue to advocate for change while we also have to provide these sort of sanctuaries for life and wholeness within our community. And the black church at its best has always been that institution that has filled in the, the gaps, uh, the, the gaps that uh, uh, were left behind, the, by, that our government and other social agencies have ignored black life. And so I think you are exactly right and that our churches and our religious institutions have to get back to being those, as we say, so, as W.E.B. Du Bois said, social centers as well as religious centers that began to fill in the gaps that can begin to nurture black life and the, the educational gaps. We know that our 
we've talked about in this country essential workers, but not essential human beings. Mm -hmm. So we know mm -hmm. that black people have disproportionately been seen as expendable human beings. Our children have been seen as expendable. Therefore, look at the schools in our communities. We can't wait for the government to do something about those schools. We've got to fill in that gap. So you are indeed right. And this is where our churches, uh, are, the, our educational institutions have uh, in the black community have typically began in our churches. Our churches and other religious institutions have to step in and to fill in that gap, have to step in to fill in uh, the gap in terms of social services, healthcare, and other kinds of things. So I just want to say that I agree with that. Uh, we have to do two things at once and multiple things at once. Advocate for change in this country and in this society. Create safe communities, which means just communities. And in the meantime, we've got to take responsibility for uh, the life of our community in affirming that black life does matter, mm -hmm. that we are more than simply essential uh, workers, uh, that we are essential human beings, and indeed we have to be the ones to affirm that as faith communities and faith leaders and faith institutions. Wow. We're on a rich conversation indeed. And we want to put a pin in it right there because we want to take just a little bit of a pause to have just a little musical reflection, right? So we can kind of reframe and reset. So at this time, we will have the musicians come forward for a selection. I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. I wish I could break all the chains holding me. I wish I could say all the things in my heart. Say them loud, say them clear for the whole round world to hear. I wish I could share all the love that's in my heart. Remove all the bars that keep us apart. I wish you could know what it means to be me. Then you'd see and agree Every man should be free
things you don't like about them, but me. so much Kiana Dell Jalen Lake Noel thank you thank you ladies that's beautiful uh, let's just talk just real quickly before we, we wrap up uh, one of the questions we often get asked is have we already lost the momentum of 2020 uh, um, you had mentioned I think before about how if we don't seize the moment we're going to lose it, and many people would say we've already lost it. Have we, Dr. Cosby? Well, again, I, I, I think that the critical race theorists and Derek Bell are accurate, mm -hmm. that there will be peaks uh, of hope that will revert back to the norm of white domination. I would, however, say and uh, that I can't, to me, I can't emphasize how we must challenge government to do right by black people. Mm -hmm. And that in the last years of his life, and I'm quoting verbatim Dr. Martin Luther King, he says, unless there is a radical redistribution of the wealth, so that those who built the country can truly be citizens. The myth that many black people have, and whites also, is that whites became so wealthy through their own agency and by pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. White people became, the white middle class was assisted by public policies of the New Deal, of Roosevelt, the Fair Deal of Truman, the Homeowners Loan Corporation redlined every neighborhood in America. All you have to do is just go online, pull up and say, redline Louisville, redline Cincinnati. They've mapped it out. This has been socially engineered where white people got monetized and we got ghettoized. The federal government created this mess. And unless we talk about repair, unless if you steal my car on Monday and you get saved on Tuesday <laughs> and you're still driving my car on Wednesday, <laughs> you were not saved on Tuesday. The sign that you were saved on Tuesday if you stole my car on Monday is not that you simply bring it back on Wednesday, but you bring it back full of gas with a tune-up and cleaned up. 
And that's, that's the Zacchaeus model. Mm -hmm. Zacchaeus said, if I have defrauded you, I, a half of my goods will I give to the poor, which has to do with just public policy. But if I've defrauded you, I will pay you back fourfold. Mm -hmm. And until we push, because the fact of the matter is, the instance, I'm a pastor in the hood. I'm, a, I'm an HBCU president. It was a black church that brought back the last HBCU in American history. A black church did that. Mm -hmm. And it has never happened before in American history. Mm -hmm. I have a gymnasium in the poorest, I'm the first to build a gymnasium, co-ops, businesses, in the hood. I've been doing this for 42 years. I have never seen black, the black community like it is right now. The churches are closing because the poor have been concentrated in, there's, there's concentrated poverty, and if you're saying, well, the churches can do it, then they should do it. Mm -hmm. But poor people in poor neighborhoods are bringing to church, not tithes, but, teeth, but tips, because they don't have the resources to keep these institutions open, because you had, first of all, JJ, who lived in the hood, right next to the, to the, the, the Jeffersons, the Evans looks next to the Jeffersons in the hood together. That was the 50s and the 60s. But then with open housing, the Jeffersons left JJ, moved on up to the east side, <laughs> left poor black people, and then got a little higher and went up to Bill Cosby and the Huxtables. <laughs> And, and JJ and the Evans are still living in urban neighborhoods without any institutions and no hope. No, they tore the projects down. Yeah. <laughs> and gentrified it. <laughs> and gentrification, right. Turn in the gentrification is like fornication. <clears throat> Somebody's getting screwed and black people are the ones. Pick up on that. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, we, we can't dismiss the role of, of government uh, uh, connivance in creating all of this. I think we could add to that list, Dr. Cosby, the GI Bill. Right. That was one of the greatest uh, factors encouraging the creation of the present-day white middle class. And African Americans were systematically denied the home ownership and the educational benefits after the World War, Second World War of the GI Bill. We can mention the looting of the Freedman's Bank at the very beginning, when the, the, the bank that was created to empower black folks and recently freed slaves was looted, and all that money was, went into the wrong pockets. So there's definitely a, a role that, that has to be played by a responsible government. I think it's critically important for us to understand that a lot of what is happening now is the result of a certain mentality. When you have uh, you know, a growing list of Congress folks and senators who are reading Ayn Rand and believe in altruism is a vice, not a virtue, uh, there has to be a pushback in terms of creating a, a, a consciousness amongst the public that's more amenable to a charitable government, a just and fair, forget charity, a just and fair government. And so I think it goes back to what Dr. Douglas was saying, just working at many different levels, working and advocating for, for uh, government policies that are more just and fair and dealing with uh, poor folks who provide a lot of that, that wealth through disproportionate uh, taxation systems. Uh, we have to be working to uh, uh, create a, a, a political culture that is sending people into the halls of power that have a different mentality from those currently occupying many of, of those offices. And we also have to be grooming our own people to go into Congress mm -hmm. and, and to have more than just the squad up there. But, but they have the whole crew up there. And I think we, we can start thinking strategically how we can do that 
and uh, in the race against gerrymandering and voter suppression and all the other mechanisms that are being put into place to create white minority rule. And so the window's open, but I think we have to have a multifaceted, multi-tier strategy to you. approach it. Right. Yeah, Dean Douglas, can you pick up on that because you intimated that earlier. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and again, thank you both for uh, your insights. Look, to pick up from that and your, your question, uh, have we lost the momentum for change? Look, I think that our country is at a crossroads. And we have to decide what kind of nation we want to be. Our country is a country that has long had, if you will, a uh, warring soul, to borrow from W.E.B. Du Bois' uh, construct, of which he spoke of uh, in 1903. We've been a nation that, on the one hand, was founded to be this quote unquote city on the hill, exemplary of American exceptionalism, which has always been synonymous with Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, read whiteness. It was founded to reflect Anglo-Saxon virtue and exceptionality, which means that it has always been a raced nation, that is to say, that race has always been that construct that has determined who is or who is not to be accepted as an American citizen. And as it has been that, it has been a nation that has never lived into what it's meant to be a democracy. On the other hand, this nation has given birth to a vision, right, of being a nation where, there, where all people can pursue life, liberty, and happiness, a nation where there is freedom and justice for all. This nation has always been a nation that has had this kind of warring soul and has had to decide what kind of nation it is going to be. It has found itself at these crisis moments in various times throughout our history, not the least of which has been the Civil War. We are at another Civil War moment. And this nation is at an intersection and at a time of crises. And we've got to make a decision about what kind of nation we're going to be, and we've got to have the kind of moral leaders and moral voices that are going to push us toward our, to, to borrow Abraham Lincoln's language, toward our better angels. That's where faith leaders come in. If not, we are going to truly find ourselves a divided nation at, reflective of the kind of division that was indeed the Civil War. We are at that moment. And so, indeed, uh, you ask whether or not we have lost the, the moment, the opportunity. This is the moment. This is a moment of decision. This is a moment of crisis. Crisis is all, always also means a moment of opportunity. And so, indeed, we have to, we have to muster the our voices, our moral courage, our moral imagination, build the kind of solidarities with people who find themselves on the underside of this democratic project to begin to seize the kind of power and the kind of voices and not be afraid to speak the truth and to challenge these voices who want to take us back to this MAGA vision. Uh, as opposed to living in to our better angels. So all I can say at this point is that we are at a crisis moment. We are at a time of decision. And our faith communities, our faith leaders must be the ones in taking the lead in bringing us toward a, a different kind of reality and mustering the moral voice, the moral courage, to indeed push this nation toward its better angels, or because, believe you me, in the direction that we are going, uh, 
we will have not simply lost uh, the momentum, as you put it, we will have lost our democracy, we will have succumbed and lost the vision and the aspiration to become indeed a more, a society in which there is indeed justice for all. Wow. Yes. Yeah. I think we're all in agreement with what uh, Dr. Douglas mentioned. Uh, one thing in answering that question specifically that we must do if we're going to uh, not be uh, deluded into thinking we've lost the momentum, we, we have to divorce our emotions from the news cycle. As, you know, uh, when, when did Black Lives Matter enter into the, the national consciousness in a big way, the 2016 election. Remember the mic being snatched from Bernie Sanders' hand, Hillary being cornered, and all of the other things. And then it, after the election was over, and one side could say, you know, black folks, you know, you gotta rally with us, as, as Mr. Biden said, if you're not a, to Charlemagne, right? If you're not a Democrat, you're not really black. And, and the other side can say, look, these scary black people, if you don't help us to become the law and order administration, they're going to take over and invade your neighborhood. And then it disappeared until 2020. And then it's all over the media. And so we're all riled up. And, you know, the tragedies culminated with the tragic killing of, of George Floyd. And not tragic, just the, the sadistic pornographic lynching of Mr. Floyd, uh, and, and, but believe me, the, the George Floyds and Breonna Taylors and Ahmed Arberries and John Crawfords and Philando Castiles and the Alden Sterlings, and they don't just get killed during election years. It's an ongoing crisis. And so we can't uh, get riled up during an election year because all of this publicity and all of this uh, action is taking place and then as soon as it disappears from the media, the momentum goes out like a deflated balloon. So we, we have to begin to, to, begin to work and, and uh, condition ourselves not to believe that because an election year passes and all of that televised uh, activity of Black Lives Matter and, and Black Lives Don't Matter, for that matter, are, are invading our consciousness via the media. And then when the, the deal is done and they pack up and the cameras turn off, you know, the killings don't stop on the one hand. And the organizing and struggle doesn't stop on the other hand. So I think if we can look beyond the news cycle, especially during these election years and these election year, year blow-ups, and believe me, 2024, when that comes, you ain't seen nothing yet. And so we have to begin now to prepare for that in terms of how we're going to organize, how we're going to respond, uh, how we're going to develop strategies to interject our thoughts and ideas and programs into the media, uh, media narrated discussion in creative ways. So we, the perception in the minds of many that we've lost momentum is simply created by the fact that, as Gil Scott Heron once famously said, the revolution will not be televised. <laughs> and because it's not televised, we go to sleep. Right. Yeah, man, yes, please. absolutely, Dr. Cosby. You know, Dr. King's last book that he wrote in 1967, you know, basically is a paraphrase of the question you asked. Mm -hmm. Where do we go from, from here? here? Mm -hmm. Chaos or community? And in the book, he gives a blueprint in which he says, unless the federal government has the will to create just policies, he, he, he is assassinated April the 4th, 1968. One month prior to his assassination, the Kerner Commission issues out its report. Otto Kerner, former governor of, 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 of Illinois, 
Johnson tags him to ask, answer the question, why did the riots take place in Newark and Detroit? And they convene a conservative group of people. And they come back after studying urban areas and say this, one, we have two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. And then it goes on to say on the very first page of the Kerner Report is that what black people cannot forget and the white people do not know is that white people have created the ghetto, they sustain the ghetto, and they tolerate the ghetto. And then it gives strategies on how we can intervene. Dr. King reads the report in March of 1968 three weeks before his assassination, and he says, and I quote, that this is a doctor giving a nation a bad medical report with a sure remedy. Mm. And the remedy he was referring to was public policy. We like to talk about personal policies. That's, that's white evangelicalism, without talking about the impact that public policies have on personal policies. So according to Stuart Burns's book on Montgomery, Stuart Burns says that Dr. King in, in, during the Montgomery bus boycott was told by a white man, you need to go back to your pulpit and just preach the gospel. And Dr. King responded, I can't tell black kids don't steal when we are creating the conditions in our society that makes them steal. Mm -hmm. And Coretta King, who in my opinion, was probably more brilliant than Martin, but does not get the credit, said, poor schools is violence. Mm -hmm. Food deserts are violence. Don't talk about why black kids are being violent. If you're not going to talk about the conditions in this city, state, and nation that is creating the violence for black kids. Well, certainly the discussion could go on and on, and this is just a starting point. And I'll remind you that it's not just 2024 that's a major election, but Kentucky has a major election in 2022 right. and 2023. You just don't vote every four years, you vote every year, every time. Um, thank you, Dean Douglas. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Shakur, Dr. Cosby. It's been a pleasure to be in the midst and to learn uh, from you tonight. And before we all disband, we do have another rendition and a moment of silence before we conclude tonight's program. Give a round of applause while the musicians are coming on the stage.
the Louisville Jazz Initiative with Dave Clark on saxophone, Jalen Lake Noel on bass, and earlier Kiana Dell on vocals. Thank you so much.